Chiza is the, uh, uh, the founder of the uh, Nutritional Skincare Academy. And she's also, just before I go on, this Nutritional Skincare Academy is a wonderful place for beauty therapists to expand their knowledge on the links between nutrition and the health of the skin. So if you want to really uh, grow, that's a great place to start. And I recommend you check it out. Uh, she's also the creator of the Flora Biome. And I've got, I've got a bottle here, one of her drinks. It's, it's uh, the brand, the Flora Biome is, is all, um, uh, how would you say? It, there's, there are elixirs and there are teas. And I think that there is a new elixir coming up soon. I've got my uh, little drink here. It's called Calm and it's all, linked to the gut health and the wellness. So uh, also, if you haven't uh, discovered her uh, products, her brand, Flora Bio, I recommend that you do. Um, so today, uh, Chisa is going to uh, dive us uh, on a roller coaster ride of hormones uh, at menopause and more specifically the estrogen. Uh, it's gonna be a fascinating talk. So I'm not gonna, hold the screen any longer. I'm going to pass it over to you, Cheesa, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. My absolute pleasure, Frank, and I'm blown away by how many people are joining us. So thank you all of you for taking time out of your busy days to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. This is a big, a big subject, a big topic. And as you know, I only have 45 minutes to deliver it in. So I am not going to be sharing everything that I know about estrogen, but I really wanted to, um, to share with you why it is so important in women's health. There are some of you who don't know me. Yes, my screen moving. Just give me a second. There are some of you who don't know me. I know that there are quite a few familiar faces. Apart from running the Nutritional Skin Care Academy, as, friend, as Frank mentioned, I also am a clinician. I work in clinical practice as both a nutri nutritionist and a dermal clinician. So I see firsthand the experiences of women who are entering the menopause or who are in the menopause. And I'm sure that there are some of you who may be noticing changes that are happening within your body as you sort of reach the 40 year mark and some of these changes may not be easy to explain i'm going to be showing you that menopause is not the only time that changes physiological changes happen they actually occur a lot earlier than that and so in clinical practice i see women who present with aging skin that they say has happened almost overnight they never had jowls before or they never had a tire around their middles and suddenly you know, as they approach menopause, they're noticing these changes. As a nutritionist, I am able to make some suggestions that include some dietary changes. And I'm gonna be sharing those with you as well. So we're going to be looking at exactly what the menopause is. We're going to be looking at some of the more common symptoms. We're also going to be looking at the importance of nutrition, as I said. And then Lena asked me to share with you five top strategies that will help to manage the symptoms and ensure that women enjoy their lives beyond the menopause. And so this presentation I'm sure will be for some of you who are maybe going through the menopause at the moment, but it may be also for younger um, therapists who have clients going through the menopause and it just helps you support them better. And if you stay till the end, I'm going to be sharing with you some clinic support that I have. And that's in terms of courses, as well as in terms of product. So when we talk about the menopause, we know that culturally, this can be a time in some cultures of great shame. I know in the West, a lot of women actually hide the fact that they're going through menopause. And they do this because they feel that at this time of their lives, they have almost become invisible. 
they feel that society does not value them as much. We are a very age conscious society. And yet you go to other, cult other cultures in the developing world, a woman who reaches menopause is celebrated. We also know that there is not a lot of research out there about the menopause. Oftentimes women are put on antidepressants when they go in to see a doctor, explaining to the doctor that they don't feel their best, they're not coping, and the automatic diagnosis is one of depression, not equating the symptoms that they're feeling to the menopause. It has only really been in recent times that the research around menopause has ramped up. And this is because it is women, women or female researchers that are really funding the research. I've got some books, where are my books? I've got three books that I was going to show you that I absolutely love. And what's great about social media is that you can actually find these authors online and you can support them or you can read you can purchase the book so there's this one here by our very own dr Ginny mansberg it's a recent book that she's just brought out there's another book here by a, a doctor called dr louise newson she's very very vocal in this space and is doing a lot of research and offering a lot of support for the menopause and then there's another book here called the Feel Good Guide to Menopause by another doctor called Dr. Nicola Gates. So the information is getting out there, but the fact that women feel unheard, the fact that women feel that doctors just want them to get on with it is something that really um, creates a lot of, of, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of a, a feeling of helplessness that they cannot get the support. And it's often said, people who have chronic conditions are often given a lot more attention than women who are going through menopause are given. And that's because the research just has not been available. So when we talk about menopause, it's actually made up of two words. And the first part of the word refers to a woman's menstrual cycle. The second part of the word refers to the cessation of that period. Menopause happens the day after a woman's last period. The problem is the day after a woman's last period is not really known. And so we use a period of 12 months to determine that period, but it occurs the day of or the day after a woman's last period. And when we talk about the changes that occur with the cessation of a woman's last period, we have to understand that we're referring to either the complete cessation or the dramatic decline of hormones of reproduction. And the key hormone is estrogen. Of course, the ovaries don't just secrete estrogen. They secrete estrogen, progesterone, and also testosterone. But it is the depletion of estrogen that has the greatest impact. And what's incredible to me is that, as you can see from the screen, estrogen influences so much. There are receptors for estrogen on the brain. There are receptors for estrogen on the bones, in the heart muscles, on the skin, and also in the genitourinary system. And so as estrogen declines dramatically during menopause, it is no wonder that women start to feel scatty. They can't concentrate or focus, they complain of brain fog. There are women who work at very high levels of their organizations who actually have to stop working because they're not as competent as they used to be as estrogen, as menopause happens. And so what we know that we are living longer. 
Yep. So as we age, we find that both the proportion of women who are menopausal, as well as the total population of menopausal women has increased. We don't just talk about the menopause though. We also talk about the period leading up to the menopause. And this period can last anywhere from four years up to 10 years. Can you imagine having menopausal symptoms 10 years before the actual menopause occurs. Some of the symptoms that these women actually suffer from are the same symptoms as women going through menopause suffer from. But because they are, they've just hit 40, for example, there is no way that they're making the connection between the symptoms that they're experiencing and the fact that they're going through menopause. So estrogen decline happens, as you can see, long before the woman actually enters menopause. And the hard thing to deal with is that you can still get pregnant while experiencing these symptoms. So the menopausal transition is that period, like I said, before menopause actually hits, where you are experiencing some of those same symptoms, but you are still able to get pregnant. Some women will find that their periods become a lot lighter. Some women will actually find that their periods become heavier that they actually produce blood clots in the process as well. So we've talked about menopause, we've talked about perimenopause. Postmenopause is actually the day that a woman stops menstruating. So in some people's minds, we think of postmenopause as maybe being four years or five years after you actually have your last period. No, you are postmenopausal the day your period ceases. And what's interesting is that women do not experience menopause the same way. There are women who suffer for up to 10 years or longer after their, lo their last period with some debilitating um, symptoms. What's really interesting though, in my little list of all of the, um, the, the body systems that are affected by estrogen decline, I mentioned heart, the heart. What's interesting is that estrogen is cardioprotective. We know that once we reach menopause, as estrogen levels decline, women actually become at a greater risk of having a heart attack than men for the first time. We also know that as estrogen declines, we also become more susceptible to suffering hip fractures that can lead to death. So osteoporosis is a very real factor that we associate with estrogen decline. And so the question is, how is it that while every woman is going to go through menopause, some women experience incredibly debilitating symptoms while other women sail through it without even a blip on the radar? I know women, my mother's one of them. I remember as a child wanting to sit, well, not, well, not as a, a child child, but I remember um, I guess my mother was going through menopause at the time and we'd want a, hug, a, a cuddle or a hug and she'd say, leave me alone, get away from me, I'm hot, I'm hot. And that was it, but she wasn't someone who was put on HRT. She didn't take HRT. And I guess back in the day, you just dealt with it. I have also seen women who you wouldn't even know are going through menopause. And so this is still a mystery. The research shows that while there is definitely a difference in the way that women experience menopause, the reasons are still yet to be elucidated. And so when we talk about these symptoms of menopause, we know that they vary from woman to woman. Some women experience very painful sex 
And this is because, as I mentioned previously, estrogen affects the genitourinary system. Some women experience thrush, they experience painful sex, they experience a reduced libido. Some husbands become long suffering because the, the wife will snap his head off at the drop of a hat and he doesn't quite understand what's going on. So I think that men need to be part of the conversation as well so that they can understand what's going on and better support their wives because every woman is going to go through this. Some women cannot seem to get comfortable at night. The doona goes on, it's ripped off. And that's because there are changes to the vaso, vaso, vasomotory system. And so temperature regulation is off. Women find that even though they are eating the same way as they did before they hit menopause, they are piling on the weight. I mentioned before that estrogen affects brain function. It's actually responsible for the production of neurotransmitters. And so as these estrogen levels decline, you will find that I mentioned mood swings, but also a state of depression can occur. And so there are lots of symptoms that we associate with this change. I've talked about um, osteoporosis as, as being a concern. Stress levels go up, and I'm gonna explain why stress levels go up shortly. There has got to be some changes that we make in order to better deal with this period of a woman's life. I just wanted to share with you a few more symptoms. Some women, as I said, women experience menopause differently. Some women can have a full head of hair while other women notice their hair thinning. You'll find also that some women experience very dry, itchy skin. I actually have a course called The Skin Changes of Menopause. And when I was writing up this course, I was amazed by the influence that estrogen has on the skin. And so some people experience skin that is very dry and very itchy. And these clients will come to see you, you know, wanting some help with this situation. And you have got to be able to explain to them, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I'll just move that back. You've got to be able to explain to them why this is occurring. I'm just trying to move this bar up here, okay. Um, digestive issues. So some women, will actually find that as menopause occurs, digestion completely changes because it starts to slow down. You'll find that women complain about feeling bloated. They start to notice that they never experienced reflux before, but that that occurs. They find also that they either are more constipated or they experience diarrhea where they never have before. There is a whole section on gut health, and I have not included gut health in this presentation because it's a presentation in itself. So maybe Frank can have me back to talk about gut health and menopause, perhaps. <laughs> but as you can see, estrogen also affects gum health. As estrogen levels decline, women's dental health is impacted. I'm just trying to, but there we go. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the impact of stress and the menopause, because this is a huge area. What women find is that as estrogen levels decline, cortisol levels come up. And so it is not something that is avoidable. What we need to try and do is to give women some strategies to manage stress. And when we talk about stress, we talk about it being a physical, mental, or emotional tension that is caused when a person perceives that the demands that they're faced with exceed their ability to cope. And during the menopause, this is so true. Women often feel overwhelmed. 
They feel that they cannot cope with juggling their work life, their home life, their relationships. And so when we talk about, you know, a, a woman snapping at her husband or going to see a doctor because they feel depressed, oftentimes it is driven by this stress response, the fact that cortisol levels increase as estrogen levels decline. And so we know that a small amount of stress is needed. It's needed for us to get out of bed. It's needed for us to get to work and get through all of the tasks that we need to do. When we feel that we can't cope, this type of stress is negative stress. And we refer to this as distress. Distress is the kind of stress that impacts our performance and drive. We know that stress can either be acute or it can be chronic. And when it's acute, this lasts for a short amount of time and it gives us that burst that enables us to perform tasks, enables us to escape from danger. The kind of stress that is problematic and that we associate with the decline in estrogen is cortisol. Now, when we think of the stress response, we know that it starts in the head. The hypothalamus perceives a stressor. It then communicates with the pituitary gland, which in turn, in turn communicates with the adrenal glands. So there is a cascade of hormonal communication. So this is where the endocrine system comes in or is activated. Now, when we talk about our stress glands, these are the adrenal glands. We talk about the adrenal medulla being the part of the gland that produces adrenaline. We talk about the adrenal cortex as being part of the gland that produces cortisol. Now, where we have chronic stress, we are talking about long-term ongoing stress. And that is the type of stress that is problematic for a number of reasons. We know that we need stress, as I said. We need a degree of stress. When we look at the role of cortisol, we know that it increases blood sugar levels. Now, if we're talking about chronic stress, this production of blood sugar is going to increase. I mentioned before that one of the concerns with menopause is that as estrogen levels decline, weight gain happens. And so this is why, as you can see, that it's not necessarily that the lady or the, the woman is eating more. It's just that physiologically, there are changes happening. If she's producing more cortisol, she is going to stack on the weight. And we see it in clinic, don't we? When ladies come to see us and they've got breakout that they can't explain. And the first thing we look at, we look at with the breakouts is where it's located. And we identify that stress is involved. The, if, we, if we do our consultation properly, we will also find that the underlying factor or driver of the breakouts is stress. And so with stress increase, we see, like I said, weight gain. We also know that as cortisol levels go up, blood pressure also goes up. The problem with blood pressure levels going up is we become a greater heart attack risk. Also, cortisol long-term, ongoing, drives low-grade inflammation. And the problem with drive of, of low-grade inflammation being persistent is that it then has a knock-on effect of driving disease states. And so these here are some of the factors that we associate with elevated levels of cortisol. Bone density is impacted. We've already talked about women suffering from osteoporosis at a higher risk where menopause has set in. Elevated cortisol is also linked to memory loss. And so that explains it when women say, Do you know what, for the life of me, 
mid-sentence, I stop because I don't, I don't even remember what I was talking about. Hot flushes, night sweats, people who find that they have very disrupted sleep. This is all linked to elevated cortisol levels. Diabetes, yes, diabetes is a big risk. I'm gonna talk about that too. So here are some more symptoms and you'll find that talking about weight gain, there's a, an increased craving for foods that we typically term comfort foods. Women start to comfort eat. They don't know why, but they just feel the need to eat foods that perhaps have very, very little nutrient um, density. Low mood, low sex drive, digestion, frequent colds are all linked to high cortisol levels. I think the one thing that really struck me doing my research was the impact of estrogen on insulin activity. I just mentioned that diabetes risk is higher with estrogen decline. And that is because there is a very strong correlation between estrogen levels and insulin. Now we know that the pancreas releases insulin in response to carbohydrates in the diet. So the consumption of carbohydrates is going to cause, once the food has been digested, it's going to cause glucose in the blood to increase. So blood glucose levels reflect the kind of breakfast or lunch that we've had. And in response to glucose levels increasing, the pancreas releases insulin. Insulin's job is to attach itself to the cell membrane of various cells, mainly muscle cells, adipose cells, but all cells in the body. And that signal that it sends into the cell causes the cell to open up and allow glucose in. Glucose is then used as energy for the cells, but by taking glucose in, blood glucose levels return to normal. Now, what happens as estrogen declines is that a woman becomes less sensitive or the cells become less sensitive to insulin. And we refer to this condition as insulin resistance. Insulin resistance has a double whammy or a double negative effect. The first thing that insulin resistance does is that it causes blood glucose levels to remain high. But it also causes the pancreas to keep pumping out insulin, trying to push down those blood glucose levels. So you now have a condition called hyperinsulinemia, which is a problem in itself, but then you also have elevated blood glucose levels. And that is where we now have a group of conditions that we term metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is what is associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's a condition of insulin resistance, as is type two diabetes, as is cardiovascular disease. So you can see that with menopause, there is a much greater health risk associated with it. And so when we look at the strategies that we can use to try to minimize these effects. Diet is number one. Women say to me when they come and see me for nutritional advice, they say, you know what? I've not done anything differently. I don't know why I'm suddenly putting, suddenly putting on weight. But actually, what we know is that we have to change the diet. So I'm going to touch on that. Exercise has also got to be a consideration. And the problem is, is that as you saw in the symptoms that I shared with you, as women move into this next phase of their lives, energy levels drop. The last thing they wanna do is exercise, but we're going to see shortly how important exercise is. And then there are a number of stress management techniques that are out there in the research that have found to also 
improve the, a woman's experience of menopause and reduce those symptoms. A lot of women drink coffee. In Australia, we are a very big coffee drinking culture. How many times have I heard women say, oh, my day doesn't get started until I've had my first coffee? So let's look at the impact of coffee. The fact that women at night to try and cope with their stressors will open a bottle of wine. The number of times I've heard women who come to see me say, when I associate their symptoms, say, with alcohol, they look at me almost scared because I'm about to tell them that they can't drink alcohol anymore. And that look of fear is, it, it just makes me realize how much of a coping mechanism a glass or two or a bottle of wine is of a nighttime. And then sleep. Sleep is also an important factor. So when we talk about eating a balanced diet, what we are talking about is trying to put into the diet as many whole foods as we can. There is actually a documentary um, on, it's on YouTube now, but I think it was either on, on um, SBS or the ABC. It might've been the ABC where it was shown. And it's called, What Are We Feeding Our Kids? And this was a mind blowing doco for me, mainly because they talked about a new category of food called ultra processed foods or UPS type foods. And these foods are being consumed in greater and greater amounts in Western societies. Definitely. Yes, so these ultra processed foods, we are eating more and more of because we are time poor. Both our partners in a relationship are working and you come home, you're exhausted. The last thing you feel like doing is cooking. But the problem with ultra processed foods is that they in no way resemble real food. And when they looked at the breakdown of the ingredients, you couldn't find one ingredient that was actually a real food. And in this doco, they talked to a young boy who liked to eat chicken nuggets that were shaped like dinosaurs. And when his mother tried to get him to eat real chicken, he said it was gross because it wasn't, it wasn't like what he was used to, which were his, his nuggets. And those nuggets had no chicken in them. And so the problem with eating an ultra processed diet is that one, it drives inflammation. It is associated with the symptoms that we associate with, um, with menopause, achy joints, lethargy, night sweats, yeah? hot flushes, all of those things. And in processed foods, we're also looking at alcohol consumption. And as I mentioned to you, Alcohol is normally consumed because it's a coping mechanism. I had a lady say to me, Chisa, when I drink alcohol, that is, it's, it marks the end of my work day and the beginning of my relaxation. And I find that it helps me unwind. But what we know about alcohol is that it leads to a disrupted sleep. You might be knocked out and go to sleep, but your important sleep is actually disrupted. We need to remember that the body needs, I'm actually talking a bit more about sleep than I want to on this slide. So I'm going to talk about sleep um, as we go along. But, but sleep is very important and alcohol disrupts it. Coffee. How many of you drink coffee in the morning? Coffee raises cortisol levels. So if you're someone going through menopause and you are experiencing the symptoms of menopause, <laughs> unfortunately, coffee adds to the burden. So the important lesson is that we can no longer eat the way that we used to before menopause. We have to make some dietary changes. And so the focus really is on eating a balanced diet, including complex carbohydrates. I mentioned eating whole foods. You should be able to look at a plate of food and identify every single ingredient in that plate of food. Lean protein that is well sourced we know that protein that is farmed carries with it its own challenges that drive inflammation mainly because farmed um, animals are, are fed grain that is inflammatory we also need to look at our fat sources we need good fat sources 
chia seeds, nuts and seeds, olive oil. Our cell membrane health depends on good fats. Our brain health depends on good fats. And then what I also find is that sometimes women will say, no, I don't drink a lot of water. Water, I could go on for a whole presentation on the importance of water, but we know that water is needed for our metabolic function. It's needed for detoxification. It's needed for cell membrane health. It is needed for just general hydration of our tissues. And so it then comes, um, the discussion then comes around how we can make water more interesting for the client because we cannot get away from drinking water. So rather than having the soft drinks and the alcohol, we need to look at the benefit of water um, to, to the body of someone going through menopause. And then I, I put down a list of key nutrients and this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of how these nutrients found in food can make a difference. Magnesium is fantastic for relaxation. It's a great nutrient to help with improving sleep. And so some foods that are very high in magnesium are dark leafy greens, pumpkin seeds, cacao, so maybe 95% dark chocolate, nuts, um, tahini, almond butter are examples. When we talk about calcium, we talked before about osteoporosis and how that becomes a real threat to a woman's health as she goes through menopause. And so with fish, it's the fish bones that are important. So this is where eating canned salmon or canned sardines are encouraged because of the fish bones. But calcium is also found in dark leafy vegetables. We know of course that it's found in dairy products, but you don't have to look only at dairy for your sources of, of calcium. Green leafy vegetables have calcium. Broccoli, legumes do. And then vitamin D is important for our low mood and loss of cognitive function or performance. And so spending some time outdoors is always encouraged. But if we're looking at sources of food, cod liver oil, oily fish, butter, they actually say that when you leave your mushrooms outside in the sun with the, the, the gills facing upwards, that the UV rays will actually increase vitamin D in the mushies. And there's research around that. And then iron. Iron has been found to deplete as we go through menopause. And so we know, I talked before about vasomotor function starting to become disrupted where women experience hot flushes, et cetera. Iron rich foods include red meat, poultry, fish, eggs, leafy vegetables. And then of course, our plant-based estrogens are also going to help the body. And these are found in flax seed, tofu, soybeans. So these are just some nutrients that definitely are beneficial as a woman goes through menopause. And then I mentioned weight training. So weights are very, very important. Okay, so as we enter menopause with estrogen decline, we also start to lose muscle mass. And this is why weight training is so important because as we lose muscle mass and as osteoporosis risk increases, our balance is off. And this is why you find that a lot of women, as they start to um, enter their 70s and 80s with no muscle mass, no muscle mass are at a risk of falls. And it's the hip fracture that we're particularly worried about because that can actually cause death. And so strength training about three to four times a week where there's some resistance exercising is encouraged. High intensity training where that's possible is encouraged also. Now I put up this photograph because this lady here, I tell you what, she is my absolute idol. I only discovered her about maybe three weeks ago, but I've gone out, I've bought my weights and you can find this woman on all social media. But why I love her was because the first picture was her at 50 years old. She now competes in bodybuilding competitions and she wins. 
And she has shown how important weight training is. But why I love Melissa is that she gives you so many tips. And her biggest tip is you have got to increase your weight or resistance training. Forget cardio, forget running a marathon, she says, because she was actually, she actually finds that running excessively increases inflammation. It increases your cortisol levels. You put on weight, right? You want to in, in, in increase resistance training. So if you, and so on her social media, she is that name all as one, Ms. Melissa Neal. Embrace stress management techniques. And so walking, walking is good, but you're doing this not for muscle strength. You're doing this just to manage your stress levels. Reading, reading is good. The number of women that say to me, Chisa, I can't tell you when I last read a book. You need to give yourself permission to do some reading. And it might be what you do before you go to bed. So rather than being on your device till very late, spend maybe that half an hour before bed reading. I cook all my, my meals. I love to cook. And I think as I've gotten older, I've become more picky with what I put in my body. I want to know what I'm eating. So I, I love cooking. Some of you will know that I create meal plans as well, because sometimes women don't know what, what to eat. And then there are so many podcasts that you can tune into when you're going on your walk. Now, this last tip is something that I found very, very helpful. Box breathing. Box breathing basically is a very easy technique that has being shown to reduce stress and that is taking in a breath in four counts so you breathe in one two three four you hold your breath for four one two three four and then you breathe out for four one two three four and you do that over and over again and you actually find your stress level starting to come down and I often do that as I'm lying in bed, not able to sleep. So between that and listening to a mindfulness, um, um, listening to a mindfulness meditation on my my uh, one of my apps, I find that both of those techniques really help. Women complain about not feeling able to regulate their temperature. They're hot and then they're cold, and so what is recommended is that you dress in layers. So that as your temperature starts to, <laughs> to go up, you peel off those layers. And it's recommended that natural fibers rather than polyesters and synthetics be, be used. And have a little, a, a little fan handy. You've got these tiny little portable fans that you can, you know, that are battery operated that, that can help with that. But it's also making a point of lowering the temperature of the room that you sleep in, because that also aids with um, better sleep. Some women even put a, a cold pack under their pillow so that when they are getting a hot flush, they just turn the pillow over and they, they've got that very cold side that, that seems to help. Stabilizing the circadian rhythm is also important. And so the aim is to try and have at least seven hours of uninterrupted sleep. And to do that, when we talk about the circadian rhythm, we know that melatonin is our sleep hormone and unfortunately we spend up to 85 percent of our time indoors in artificial lighting the computer light yet yeah, the lights overhead i've got my ring light on and what normally happens is the body naturally at dusk starts to release melatonin if we are in a, an environment that is constantly lit up then it reduces the amount of melatonin that is produced and so it's very, very important for us to limit the use of electronic devices before bedtime. I always talk about encouraging someone to have a shower or a bath. And then the last half hour, spend it with some doing some self-care. And so this is the last point, because I know that we're bang on oh, two minutes over. Self-care is very important. I mentioned some relaxation techniques, but in the literature, it actually shows that yoga and Tai Chi have been very effective at reducing those stress levels. Self-care is my last bonus point because I recognize that we don't do enough of it. If I ask my client what she does for self-care, oftentimes she can't tell me. But it's also having a massage. We know how wonderful we feel when we have a massage. It's taking time to have a facial on a regular basis. 
a manicure, a pedicure. Yep. So I guess my last and final message is we as women are all going to go through menopause, but it should not be a time of our lives that we associate with the downhill, the downhill decline as we await death. When we think about it, our periods have stopped. We can't get pregnant. A lot of women are actually embracing this time of their life. It is actually a time of life when women usually have their kids grown up. They have a lot more choice in what they want to do, how they want to live their lives. Women change jobs, you know, they, they pick up new hobbies, etc. So it is a time for celebration. And what I'm hoping is that for my presentation today, that you understand more about it, for women who are around that menopausal or perimenopausal age, if you are perimenopausal, you do not want to wait until menopause to start making changes. As you can see, the decline in estrogen has very real impacts physiologically. The fact that it causes bone density decline means that by incorporating some weight training you are and, and eating better, you are better prepared for when menopause happens. And that may in some way reduce the symptoms that you actually experience. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I just want you to know that I have a class called the Skin Changes of Menopause. Um, it's online and it's received, uh, received great feedback from it. And I think because we are skin therapists, we need to know how to support our clients. And I'm happy to offer you a 15% discount on this class if you email me um, and let me know that you're interested. Um, Frank mentioned my products. I've actually brought out ingestibles for practitioners. They are practitioner only products. And funnily enough, it was my menopausal women that made me produce this line. Women who were freaked out when I mentioned that they needed to stop drinking alcohol and the fact that we serve calm in a champagne flute with sparkling water, the feedback that I always have is, oh my God, Chisa, it's like a cocktail. I don't even miss my drinks of a nighttime because they're not drinking as much of a nighttime, they're sleeping better. So you've got all of these wonderful benefits that are associated with the fact they're not drinking. But apart from it being an alcohol alternative, it actually has stress modulators in it. So I've included adaptogenic ingredients such as rhodiola, and I've got passion flower in there, I've got lemon balm in there, ashwagandha. So women feel their stress levels go down, but they also sleep better. And then I have a, a tea called digest. And remember I mentioned that digestion starts to suffer as you reach menopause. And so this is a tea, it's a herbal tea. It has ingredients in it that help with soothing bloat and also helping with digestion and so like I said they are practitioner only so let me know if you are interested in becoming a stockist and then I have customized meal plans and so for my menopause meal plan that I customize with your clinic information so you'll have your logo you'll have your your clinic name and then the second page I basically explain what the condition is so when you give this meal plan to your client, they have an understanding of why their diet needs to change. And the plan includes recipes that are high fiber, they have healthy fats, lean protein, packed full of phytonutrients, and I have no refined processed foods in there. So that is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, that was fascinating. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Um, do, are there any questions, perhaps? I was going to say, yes, uh, maybe we can uh, get some questions. Can you un, un uh, share your screen? Sure, sure. So we, we can, uh, one thing I, I, I have to, to say is that, um, that you mentioned was that uh, women feel unheard about. The, the list of symptoms uh, from a drop of estrogen was so long. It's incredible. The ramification that uh, estrogens play and um, so uh, that was really interesting you know that you feel that women are, are not heard even mm. among the, the professionals mm. also what I really thought was uh, uh, 
pertinent uh, for me personally was that you, you say bring men into the conversation. Yes. All the women are in relationship and they, sh they you can't expect if, if already, you know, they feel unheard that, that the men actually understand what's going on. And I think that that's a really important one. Do you have any um, advice in how they should approach that? How do they should talk about it with men? It's interesting, you know, Frank. So I did a presentation on my social media page. I actually did a series on menopause. And my brother and his wife watched it together. Oh, yeah. Well. And as women, we, we need to understand, right? Because we're all going to go through it. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then you can teach us men. And then, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Don't, don't keep your partners in the dark. They need to come on the journey. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. Thank you.